Uh, well, I'm, my name is Gregory Green. I am, I am raised in, in Idaho, about 1,800 miles from here, and kind of up in the, in the highlands part of Idaho. So my hometown sits at 5,000 feet. And I only say that because it's September 30th today, and they had a snowstorm over the weekend. <laughs> and so some ways I'm feeling good about myself being where the sun is shining. <laughs> and some ways I'm missing it because I miss the cold on occasion. But uh, yeah, I, uh, I grew up in a very, very small town and, and uh, have kind of moved around a little bit through my lifetime. And you, you teach here. What do you, what do you teach here? Uh, I teach economics, but we only have the introductory economics here, and so I also teach in the MBA program and the operations management part of the business program as well. So anything, anything that has anything to do with mathematics, because that's been one of my specialties, is what I teach for the business school. Hmm. So as a economics professor and operations specialist for the business school. Was that the dream as a kid or what did you want to do as a kid? You know, somewhere in the back of my mind, and I don't know why, but as a kid I had wanted to get a PhD only because I thought it sounded cool. <laughs> I had no idea what it entailed or what the work level was. And then somewhere in my very late teens, as I was working with my grandfather, uh, you know, it started to run through my mind what well, maybe I should take over the family business. And so I started thinking more locally. Uh, and then when I was in college, uh, I can say that uh, I did not excel academically for a long time. Uh, somewhere in the, my sophomore year of college, it's like a giant light bulb went on. And uh, all of a sudden, everything started coming clear to me. And I started working harder academically than I ever had before. And uh, I started to enjoy it. And then somewhere towards the, my senior year as an undergraduate, I started thinking, well, I wonder what it would be like to teach. And so I hadn't really thought about, I mean, I first got into economics because I had an econ professor who had been a chief economist at Motorola Corporation in the late 70s, and he had talked about getting paid well over 100000 a year for his work, and my ears peaked up instantly, thinking, well, okay, I could do that. Uh, but somewhere along the way, the teaching became more interesting to me than the money, because uh, I certainly don't teach for the money, I mean, even though it does pay well. It, it pays okay. At least my profession does. Mm. You know, as you think about your desires as a kid today, if you were to draw up a dream job, what would be your dream job today? I really like to to do uh, like numerical analysis. Uh, I like to take people's data and just kind of see where it leads me. So maybe my dream job would be to just be in a room with a small group of people of a similar mind, a nice, a nice functioning computer, and just a chance to kind of see you know, what, what you know, for example, maybe, maybe for even like Amazon, the giant Amazon, and just pull through all of the data that comes in uh, based on consumers' searches and preferences. And just be able to say, okay, I can apply economic theory to what people are doing, and this is what it would look like if I have those, if I had access to that information. So I think some sort of a direct application of economics would be appealing to me. Just, just me alone with my thoughts sometimes. <laughs> um, did anything happen in life to spur you on towards this? pursuit of economics, numbers, business, and higher education? I had always had an interest in mathematics, even though I wasn't all that good at it. Uh, in high school, I, 
I took a lot of our upper division math in high school, not because I thought it was, not not because I did well in it, but because my two best friends were there and they did well in it. And so I was just kind of following them around. And so as a teenager, I had thought about math. Maybe I want to do something that direction. Um, then I went to a two-year school. It doesn't exist anymore by this name, but it was called Ricks College then. And at Ricks, um, I started I, I started to mature mathematically. And so there's where that light bulb turned on. In fact, it was a math class I was in where the light bulb did turn it on. Uh, and then econ, uh, the econ, this Richard Moss was his name, and he's the guy I told you about that was the head economist at Motorola. Uh, he had left the job at Motorola and had come to teach at this two-year school, but he was also from my hometown. And so I had a lot of his oldest daughter and I went to school together. I had a lot of connections to him and his family. And so uh, I wasn't planning on learning or becoming an economist. Uh, the business school at Ricks College had a 7 a.m. class. Everybody had to take. Nobody got any credit for it. And I was commuting uh, about 35 minutes to, to get there. So I would have had to have left my house at 25 past 6 to get to a class that didn't offer any credit. And I was talking to Richard Moss and he said, it's a two-year degree. Switch it over to econ. You don't have to be here at 7. And when you leave and go somewhere else, you can always change it back to whatever you want. So I did switch my major over to econ, and then I took a third econ class. I'd taken the introductory micro and macro, but he also taught a managerial economics. And again, I had that experience this third time seeing it. It was like, oh, this really isn't that hard. You know, I, and so I started to see it much clearer. Uh, things that attracted me to higher education was probably just my experiences while in higher education. You know, I went to graduate school at Temple University in Philadelphia, and I had some really good professors there. Uh, I had some that, uh, I, my dissertation advisor, for example, had been a graduate from Yale University. I had said to him once, I said, you know, hey, it must have been great to get to go to a nice school like that. And, you know, he just kind of looked at me and he said, you're getting a much better education here. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, you and I meet once a month and we talk about your dissertation and where it's going and how you're doing. He said, I saw my advisor twice in the entire six years I was there. He said, once to hand in my proposal and once at my defense. He never had time for me. He said, so I was kind of on my own. And so, you know, I had a lot of people like him that were just, they were willing to give me time. I had finished my bachelor's degree at Idaho State, and econ was a small program there. I knew every professor. They knew me. I had taken multiple classes. In fact, I would sometimes arrange my schedule so I could take classes from certain people. And, uh, I don't know, it just, it just uh, began to increasingly intrigue me, the learning process did. But on the other side, I feel like I've spent a lifetime learning about stuff and not actually going out and doing it, which is kind of weird. I mean, I spent a few years doing consulting work, and some of the work I did was very, very intriguing. I loved it, and some of it I didn't care much for. And so I was drawn back to uh, higher education. I do like watching students when they have their, what I like to call, aha moments when you can see a light bulb turn on in their head, and all of a sudden they go, oh yeah, okay, that's clear now. Um, I can't get everybody there. As much as I would like to think I could initially, I have learned over 20 years that maybe there really are some people who just aren't gonna get econ. Uh, but that's okay too, because we all kind of have strengths in different things. And as a very wise person once told me, isn't it a great thing that it takes all kinds to make a world go around? And so, you know, it's uh, it's okay to struggle. Uh, absolutely. In a sentence, how would you describe your call for life? Well, I don't even know if I could do that in one sentence. Um, 
my call for life. I mean, I, I know what I would hope it would be. I don't know if I've hit it. My hope would be that I'm able to help at least a few people, if not a lot of people, better understand things that I'm passionate about. So that, and, and I'm hoping that it helps them um, have a better life. And do you see your job aligning with that call? Yeah, I, I do see my job aligning with that call, but I, I have found some frustrating things with it too. Uh, I have learned that not everybody getting an education really wants one, and that's been frustrating. Uh, I mean, it, it's, I've, I've had way too many people who behave as though they're just jumping through a hoop instead of people who are anxiously and compassionately engaged in what they're doing. Uh, I see those people too, but the, but the mix I don't think is quite even. And so I, I think uh, for, for me, when I finally understood education, it became, it became a passion. And I, I used to prepare for tests, walking to class and reading my notes and then just kind of walk in and hope for the best. And then I went from that to, I was so well prepared, I would take the night off before a test so things could settle in my mind. And I would dream about it. You know, I would have dreams uh, if my calculus class or a microeconomics class, I would be you know, in my dreams being attacked by things called indifference curves and, you know, it just, it, it was just so different when I finally be, got that passion than it had been prior to. Hmm. So obviously as an educator, as a mentor, as an advisor, you've had impact on people's lives. Not only being, not only mentioning being a dad and being involved in our community, but who's most impacted or influenced you know who you are and how to express that in the world? I don't know if I could boil it down to one person. I could probably boil it down to three people. Uh, first off, it had to be my grandfather. Uh, he and I, I went to work for him when I was five years old. And I, uh, my first job was to sweep the floor in his grocery store, which, you know, I look back on that and as a five-year-old, it had to look awful. I know I think about how I how I used to perform that task, and it couldn't have been nice when I was done. Somebody else obviously had to come clean up behind me, but my granddad let me stay there, and I I worked with him in that capacity for eleven years. And then when I was eight, I started stocking shelves, and you know I I fourteen I started working you know, the register and spending my Saturdays working and. You know, it was, uh, he taught me my work ethic, and, uh, and he also taught me some pretty important lessons, and some of them were really simple. Like uh, the first day I was uh, working a Saturday, uh, I shadowed him all day long. I, I don't know if he was tired of it or not, but I do know that at about 7.30, he kind of looked at me and he says, now you've seen everything that I do on any given day. He said, now, when you, when you, come back next week, look around and see what needs to be done and do it on your own. And you know, it was so, it was so simple, but it's funny, I now expect that of everybody, but I don't think everybody had that lesson. You know, and, uh, and so that was one. Uh, and you know, he wanted me to take over his business, but he also supported me when I went and decided to get a PhD instead. Uh, the, the next one, uh, would have to be this Richard Moss that I've mentioned from my hometown. I mean, it was it was interesting to see somebody who had succeeded. My hometown, there's 600 people. I don't know if you could compare it to Phelps. We weren't quite as isolated as Phelps, but at least roughly that same size. Um, but to, to see him, and I can see, there were three economists my age that came out of Ryrie. And, and so you gotta think, okay, well, he must have had an influence somehow. And he did. I mean, he's the one that kind of talked me in to taking a different course load. And I was there when I kind of saw what I wanted to do. And then my other one would have to be my advisor, my dissertation advisor, 
who uh, always had some sort of a mentorish kind of thing to say to me, that would always put me at ease and tell me that, no, you are doing good, even if it doesn't feel like it. You know, I, uh, I think I asked him once, I asked him once about uh, my own research, and I said, you know, nobody's ever going to read this. And he said, while I was doing my dissertation, I went into the stacks in, at Yale, and I found a dissertation that had been published in the 1890s, and it was sitting on the top of the stacks with a layer of dust. He said, I pulled it off the shelf. I had to blow the dust off just to get to it. He said, and I like to think that the guy who wrote that was sitting somewhere looking down at me and saying, finally, somebody's using the information that I put down. And so, you know, it was stuff like that that helped make me feel like I was making a difference. If people were watching this and they said, you know, Dr. Green, like, you are living my life. I, I, I want to do what you're doing. What did you do to put yourself in this position? I didn't stop. <laughs> you know, uh, it was funny. While well, I was going through graduate school, graduate school was harder than I had ever anticipated. Uh, and what I mean by that, it's not that the work was difficult. It was the pace. The pace was difficult. Uh, I, I think even graduate school has got a little softer in the last 20 years. Uh, but uh, I, I had several people in the first year that just decided they were done and they left. And they decided it wasn't worth the effort or it wasn't worth the time. And, uh, and I just kept pushing and pushing. And, uh, and then uh, I, got, I, I always thought you know, there was this sequence, you had to take these courses, you had to pass these two theory exams, and the theory exams you had to finish within the first two years. And, and so I thought, okay, well I get that done, life will be easier. So I got it done, and then there were two field exams. And the field exams weren't near as difficult because they were things I was already passionate about. And I thought, okay, I get the field exams, I get the coursework done, my life will be easier. And then I got to the dissertation stage. <laughs> I spent three years writing my dissertation, but I also finished ahead of schedule compared to most of the people who started with me. And so, you know, I, I uh, but I just didn't stop. And I, I think that that's the key in so many things, is to not is not to decide, okay, I guess is I'm not cut out for this, and take a step backwards. Maybe it's more appropriate to fight a little harder and take a few steps forward and see if things shake out the way you thought they would, or to try to figure out how do I, or to figure out how do I get myself to better understand. I mean, there are things that in the last two years that have kind of eluded my mind for 20 years that I, I knew the process, I knew how to do the math, I knew everything about it, I just didn't know why I was doing it. And within the last two years, standing in front of a class, teaching it, you know, I've had a, again, I still have those aha moments where I go, really, is it that simple? Was it really that simple? And it was just, you know, continual pushing and then finally seeing what was going on. I do try to transfer that. I don't know how successful I am. Mean, this is the one hard thing about my job is you never hear how people turned out. You know, it's a, uh, it's not quite of a, a thankless of the job as being a mother, but it sometimes feels that way. Mm. In your years of being a student and now being a professor, you've had plenty of conversations with students. And sometimes you have the student who says, you know, Dr. Green, you have this very clear sense of who you are, but I have no idea. I have no idea what my call is or what I'm supposed to do with my life. And when you meet that student, what advice do you have for them? Well, in my mind, I say stuff like, well, you're only 19, you're only 18, you're only 20. You don't have to know right now. And certainly my vision was not that clear when I was 18, 19, and 20. You know, I, I, had, uh, I had a lot of things that I did between ages 19 and 21 that kind of helped me mature a little bit. And when I got back to school at age 21, my mind was a little clearer and I could see things a little better, but uh, 
you know, even even now I I think, okay, I, I know my subject well. It didn't happen overnight. I try to transfer information so that it's not as hard for the next group coming up, knowing full well that they're going to struggle with it too. I would just like to be able to present it in a way that they don't struggle as long or as hard. Um, and so I usually try to lift them up and say, you know, you can do this. And I always think they can because I did, you know, and, uh, and I know that uh, it doesn't seem when you're, when you're in the middle of the fight, it doesn't seem like there's a way out sometimes. But if you just keep pushing and pushing and pushing, things do come. Uh, you know, you, you, I was in my 40s before I finally figured out how to do abstract mathematics. And I've been fighting with that since I was 24 years old. And, you know, it's just, was it always clear? Absolutely not. It's clearer now, but there are still things that I fright and struggle with. I guess my point being, you never stop the fight, you never stop the struggle. Things become clearer as you go. The only time they don't become clearer is when you stop and decide, I can never get this, and you push it aside. But like I tell my students, you know, that take stats for me, I tell them, you can live a normal life without knowing statistics. But if you learn it, it will open things in life that you would never have imagined. And so, that's some of my advice I give my students as well, because it happened to me. And I always think that I, was, I always think that there's really nothing special about what I did. It was a work ethic and it was an enjoying the subject as I went. Mm.